Diana Nami's vital work. She's chief executive of the Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization and a Barclays Woman of the Year Award winner for advocacy, training and counselling of women and girls from cultures which do not offer the kind of freedom of expression which Andrew's been talking about and shows in his show uh, to women or indeed men, um, to Middle Eastern and North African communities affected by so-called honour killings and forced marriage and violence. Now, you were born into an Iranian Kurdish culture. How early in life did you start to think about these issues, about, about women, about justice? Yeah. I was actually very, very young. Maybe I was that young that still I, you know, hide myself behind my mom's a little scared, child. Yeah. A little child, yes. Uh, we have been invited to a wedding, I remember, uh, and uh, At that time, and still I believe it is, that the wedding took about three days. All people were dancing, of course, wearing their bright Kurdish color and uh, very happy, eating uh, lots of music. So the actual day for the wedding is the last day when we were happy. In the evening, just everything turned to be exactly opposite and... Women started crying, men started shouting, and this change for me was quite scary. And uh, I just heard from women that they say bride was not virgin, and the husband say that she is not pure, and uh, I have to send her back home to her parents' home. And uh, I saw bride; she was sitting in a corner. She was beautiful long dark hairs and black eyes and she was crying she was shake, shaking holding her her knees and uh, her mom came forward and uh, he begged the groom to not send her back as her father and brother would kill her because she was not a virgin and bringing shame to the family so was she saved uh, she was saved by my father a great and man. my it was he was and uh, it was more than three hundred people in the wedding and he was the only person stand to defend her and told the groom if you send her back you have to leave, leave this city as well so the atmosphere changed quite quickly and people started to say yes yes don't send her back the groom didn't send her back she was in term of her you know life and death. She was alive, but she became like a slave for her all her life. Now you, uh, with this extraordinary early early achievement, and you know your father's achievement, and you witnessing this as a child, it, it obviously was inspiration to you. And you set up a women's group when you were still in your teens. But uh, those early days before the Iranian Revolution and the heavy Islamic cultural takeover, did that change? Um, did the theocracy make a difference? Um, to your life, did you imme- did things immediately change when the Ayatollahs you know, came in? Oh, oh, of course. Uh, before that, uh, this event and quite few other events, I think, make make my life to be different from perhaps many other friends of mine. Uh, I remember the first day, I think it's important to say here, the first day I went to school, I was five, when our teachers started to talk to us in Persian. Because I am Kurdish, we couldn't mm. respond in Farsi. So she started to beat all of us. It mm. was 35 students. All of us were five years, the first day in school. And she told us, this is the last time you are speaking Kurdish. I think this event and the other one that happened for these poor women make me think about that. Why women <clears throat> should be treated like that, why virginity or something like that can be... And why can Kurdish cause. people should be treated like that. You're a minority Again, inside exactly. a minority. And yeah, what everything. is wrong with our language? So they make me to think about those things and make me to think about political situation in Iran. So during the Shah time, I started to become a political activist. And uh, I remember the first slogan we wrote in uh, the university I was... Uh, I started to be a teacher, when study for teaching. The first slogan we wrote was that the Iranian oil is cheaper than French water. Still, I'm laughing at that. Not, perhaps <laughs> it's still true. But then 
at that time, I, I was questioned for those things. But when the revolution started and the Islamic Republic came to power, actually the situation for women getting worse, worse and, worse. and worse. And they force women to go home. They force women to cover themselves. I mean, when I'm talking about force, it's not just pushing them. They uh, acid attack women. They hang them in the street. They beat them up. They mm. imprison them. They executed women throwing acid on their face if they wear makeup. I mean, this was the situation for women from Iran who were, up, you know, living a life like today in Europe. And it was extreme. In, in, in the end, you, you, you had to flee. You fled across the mountains, became a freedom fighter with the Kurdish Peshmerga fighters and travelled through Iran and Iraq and Turkey, defending, meeting women and girls. Were you respected among the freedom fighters as a woman, because they, they were quite macho men too. Were you, were you yeah. respected? Did you gain respect? Well, at the beginning, actually, they oh, definitely we gained respect. We made lots of changes, and I am so proud to think, to, to think about what we have done. We changed the movement about women in Kurdistan, in Iran, and the whole area. When uh, I joined the Peshmerga, it was supposed that women to just work behind the scene and in hospitals, in kitchen, and doing those kind of work. But then a group of women like myself, we said, why we are different? We have been treated. We can do everything that a man do. Uh, and why the classical, classic Peshmerga is male member of the community. And, of course, I remember when we asked them that we can be trained as a full Peshmerga, having, uh, being armed and even going to the front line. Some Peshmerga says that if women took gun and come to be equal to me, I will leave my gun and leave back, go back. <laughs> and quite some of them did the same, which we didn't mind because <laughs> we were there. They were the useless train. ones. <laughs> uh, yes, and we were very strong and very powerful. And you, we changed you, that uh, uh, culture. You came here as a, as a political refugee with, with your child in the end and you, you founded the Iranian Kurdish Women's Rights Organization and here you speak out and advise government about violence and honour killings and so on against women. Are you shocked that even here, even within this country, you are having to do this work? I was shocked because, you know, for 12 years I was Peshmerga in early more than 20 years I was political activist and I thought when I come to the UK then my fighting days were over but when I came here I have been provided an interpreter because I couldn't speak English she was a very lovely Kurdish woman and uh, just soon after two meetings I heard that she was killed in an honor killing and uh, you're in this country your interpreter in the UK, was killed of course my interpreter in the UK the husband uh, suspected that she's flirting with one of her colleagues. They took her back to Iraq. They killed her there. The husband returned back to the UK. So with the help of one of my friends, I called police. It was 90, late 1996. I called police and told them that uh, this is the case. Police told me that this case happened in Iraq. We cannot do any investigation. I told them, but she was a British citizen. And uh, she was lived in the UK for 11 years. You have to take care of your citizen in other yeah. country. And he told me it doesn't make any difference. And by the way, honor killing is your culture. We have to respect. You have to respect your culture. The police. It, the police told me, yes. Otherwise, you will call us racist. And I was more shocked by the police reaction rather than death of my interpreter. Because what I thought, we are in a country that women's rights highly implemented, highly respected. And, and if I was thinking if she was a white British citizen being killed in another country, would the police still say the same? Mm. Definitely not. And uh, they should do the same mm. for That's... my interpreter. It seems, it seems strange but useful. And I, 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 it might seem frivolous to say this, but t talking to you just after Andrew Logan's account of the Alternative Miss World, I'm sort of rather <laughs> thrilled at the fact that you've had Russian and Nigerian contestants, yes. countries where there is tremendous persecution Absolutely. of gay men in the same, in the same way yes. that, that women are persecuted. The, it, that does, it does count, doesn't it? I mean, the, the, the fact well, absolutely. that... Absolutely. I think it, all those little things count. You know, we can just do our... 
But definitely, yes. yes. And uh, yes, so shocking. Actually. It's very shocking. Yes. Do you feel living here, just for something about yourself, living here yeah. and doing these useful things, do you feel as if you're in exile? If, if one day you could go home to an autonomous, a free Kurdistan, would you want to go back to your home? I don't know, really, because I'm thinking the most of my life I used to live in the UK. And uh, it's about now 16 years I am here. Whereas when I was 15, I left my home and uh, then became Peshmerga with no place, no country. My life was always, I was in the front line and any time I have been injured twice. So I could be killed. I never mm. thought that I am mm. in Kurdistan. I don't know if I one day go back. I'm dreaming of that, to go back one day and see. You know, I miss the dust of the street. But I don't know if I can live there anymore. Mm. Uh, my heart is with, with them. My fight is, again, still for equality and for women's rights in Iran, in, in Middle East, and even here for Middle Eastern I'm women. Here. And you there, say, yes. You were in Birmingham yesterday. <laughs> oh, yes, I was in Birmingham <laughs> yesterday. And uh, I will go around the world, not only UK, to, you know, to make the voice of women to be here and the equality because I strongly believe on a killing force, marriage, child marriage, FGM, they are crime. They are not culture and it shouldn't be tolerated as a culture. There is no justification for that. Yeah. We need to end the culture of cultural relatives in this country. Roderam was the last scandal of yeah. treating communities or perpetrators as their culture. Power, it's, it's power to you, power to it all. We, we just turned finally